Okay, so I'm going to talk about capsules related to bacteria pathogenicity. And so first I'll give you some um, background information about capsules and then how, did this, how does this relate to bacteria pathogenicity and give you examples of that. So this is a, the first figure from the review paper that we read looking at mechanisms of bacterial pathogenicity. You'll notice in panel A we have this pathogen, bacterial pathogen. When it's introduced into the host, there's a number of different factors that allow it to um, be successful as a pathogen, one being the capsule. And that this capsule can actually lead to a frustrated phagocyte phagocytosis, and so we'll talk a little bit more when we talk about the function, but just keep in mind this is a nice figure um, that summarizes up some of the bacteria pathogenicity um, factors that influence the microbe host interactions. Okay, and so the capsule, it's an extracellular sugar coating, um, so it's polysaccharides that are actually secreted out, so in the review article they refer to it as the exopolysaccharides. So there's sugars that are secreted out past the cell membrane and cell wall. Um, sometimes this is referred to as the glycocalyx, and it can be a slime layer. So with the slime layer, these are where the polysaccharides are loosely attached to each other, kind of like a fluffy whipped cream frosting on like a cake. And with the capsule, usually these are tighter bound, so more like an M&M, the cake coating covering an M&M or Smarties. And so the capsule has several different functions. One, it could allow for adherence to different surfaces. Um, so especially if you have like a slime layer, the slime layers can actually interact with each other, interlock, and create the basis for a biofilm for, to form. Now the capsule, the glycocalyx, is also important to protect the cells from any kind of drying effect. So this is really important in like soil bacteria because soil bacteria are going to go through periods where they're not going to have a lot of um, water around or the soil dries out. And so that capsule, glycocalyx, actually sugar coating, actually protects it from drying out and desiccating. So not all soil bacteria can produce endospores. So again, this is really important for soil bacteria to be able to do. Now, you can metabolize sugars, and microbes can too. And so they can actually break down their capsule and use it as a reserve. So it's kind of like a rainy day fund. Um, so if, you're, if the microbe is in an environment where there are no um, material to digest, there's no carbohydrates, they can use this polysaccharide layer. And when we're looking at pathogenicity, one of the important functions of the capsule is being able to protect the bacteria cell from engulfment or phagocytosis. So, you know, in our first unit, we talked about phagocytosis. We have um, white blood cells that, un that are going to engulf um, foreign material, these bacteria. We need to have direct contact in order that, for that to initiate between the receptors on the phagocyte and um, ligands, um, pattern repeats that are on the bacteria. And so when we have that direct contact that allows the process of phagocytosis, the engulfing to occur, and so the capsule actually disrupts that. It prevents that direct contact from happening. So again, if you think of like an M&M with candy coating, um, if your phagocyte it becomes very difficult to grab that M&M because of candy coating. Now, um, this is taken from an online, free online textbook, um, textbook of bacteriology.net. Um, so the link is provided at the bottom of the um, slide. But this is just meant to show you um, the different capsule com components. So sometimes polypeptides, polysaccharides are the more common form of your capsule. Um, and some different organisms, gram positives and gram negatives, can have a capsule layer. And those subset, sub, um, subunits, the actual polysaccharides or polypeptides that make that up, differ between them. Um, so on the figures, you can see on the colony morphology, that kind of mucousy, wet appearance of bacillus anthrax, indicating that it most likely is producing a capsule or slime layer. On the right of the slide, you'll see a capsule staining. Um, so it's 
pretty much just the negative stain that you do and you can see the capsular, this halo that occurs around the bacteria. A lot of times with the capsule staining, again you do like a negative stain but then you counter stain um, so that your bacteria are stained. So again in that panel you can see how you have your bacteria present but then there's a halo around it and that indicates that there's capsules present. So looking at bacteria pathogenicity and the capsule, most microbes um, that are pathogenic do produce a capsule. So just because you produce a capsule does not make you pathogenic, it just could make you a good microbe because you can attach, you can sur survive off of your capsule. Um, it's really the ones that are using it for the mechanism of evading phagocytosis um, that are potential pathogens. And so Streptococcus pneumoniae, um, which is our general club paper, um, for fodder. Um, Pseudomonas and also E. coli have K antigens. Um, it's referred to as a K antigen because capsule in German is actually start, starts with K. Um, and so this blog um, that I've included the link for um, talks about how did E. coli get named K12. So K12 is the strain of E. coli that typically infects humans. Um, and again, that K refers to a capsule antigen. So if we had an antibody to K12, we could take a specimen, we could stain it um, to see whether K12 was present. And if it was present, we would know you were infected with K12. Now, there are other capsule antigens for E. coli, such as K88. K88 is um, found in the strain that commonly infects pigs. K99 is the strain that commonly infects um, bovine, so cows and calves. Okay, so again, uh, this K antigen could be used to identify which um, strain of E. coli you have, um, and then is this a strain that can infect that species? So I highly recommend um, checking out this blog um, because the writers, the authors of the blog commonly are um, on the podcast, uh, on a podcast called TWIM. TWIM is This Week in Microbiology and they have PhDs, MDs, guest speakers coming on where they talk about different papers. Um, so it's interesting, at least I find it interesting, um, and it's hosted by the American Society for Microbiology. And so obviously the focus, the M stands for microbiology. There's also TWIP, which is this week in parasitology. So uh, I love these resources as far as yeah, having students engage in hearing scientists talk. So it's very much like how our journal club papers are, where they just sit down and they chat. So um, the punchline for this blog was how did E. coli get its name? K-12, they just decided they could figure it out. They don't know why. Um, so they'd always had heard that maybe it was, if you're familiar with um, multi-wall plates, you'll have your columns in your rows and that it was probably, you know, K, um, row K, slot 12, but they came up with, they couldn't really figure it out. So um, hopefully this video is helpful at looking at capsules um, so you have a better understanding of their function and um, some examples of microbes that have capsules and how they're named. Thank you.